Okay, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Adrain Automobile Museum and to our uh, program today, uh, Using Wood to Shape Metal, uh, the Art and Craft of Wood in Coach Building. Now, this is a really interesting uh, presentation that uh, we will have tonight uh, from Ray and uh, Rick of Enfield Auto Restoration, um, because it's both what I expected, frankly, uh, when we were talking about the ways that wood is used to support and to create the bodies of, of cars, but it's also about the process of making the parts as well. So it's a many layered uh, conversation and uh, quite interesting, I think, uh, certainly. And uh, it's also very exciting when we were chatting a little earlier uh, about some of the work which you'll see uh, on the screen here. They brought a few slides as well as some amazing props. And uh, this is not a lecture presentation. They're going to describe what it is that they do and how they do it, but if they mention a term that you're not familiar with, you can raise your hand and ask a question. I'll be glad to explain it better to you. Um, mm -hmm. I always love these things because I learn so much. There's so much I don't know, which is great uh, getting to uh, work with guys like <laughs> these who uh, know a lot that I don't. Uh, one of the things that was so fascinating is the fact that uh, their shop, Enfield Auto Restoration in Enfield, Connecticut, has done amazing work for spectacular uh, clients, uh, including one of the things that you'll see here is a car that is uh, in the uh, collection of the Lauman Museum in The Hague in the Netherlands, an amazing museum, and the car that they, that they worked on is just beautifully done, and it's all about the details. Um, talking about this exhibition and sort of the four main aspects of wood as it relates to cars and boats, uh, we talk about the uh, utility, efficiency, style, and fashion. And you'll certainly hear a lot about the efficiency and utility, but also how wood and these tools lend itself to the fashion and style as well. So I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, chat. And uh, without further ado, I will uh, leave it. Oh, before I forget, I want to also thank our wine sponsor for our seminars, Greenvale Vineyards, and hope you're enjoying their wines. And we're very grateful for them to help support this series. So, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Rick Lees. This is Ray Millette. Ray, um, Ray owns. I work at Enfield Auto Restoration. And we were asked to come tonight and talk a little bit about what we do and how it relates to the display at the museum tonight. Uh, both of us are far more comfortable with its being interactive. Um, we're going to talk through some slides and show you some things that we've done and parts that we're building and some coach work we're building, but please ask questions. Um, we've got many different aspects of what we do that we'll be going through. So um, what I think I'll do is... Yeah, you want to start out with the, uh, with the taillight? Or? Sure. Sure. Or yeah, that's, um, we've got two things. We've got a slideshow and some of these support the slideshow. And a lot of these are forms and patterns that we've made for the manufacturer of parts that are unavailable. So yeah, let's, let's talk about some of this stuff first. Okay. So this is a, um, um, a taillight bracket uh, that's, that's not available. Uh, and so we were fortunate enough uh, to be able to get um, the uh, blueprints uh, from the Henry Ford uh, Museum. And um, we have uh, in-house a, um, a pattern maker. And so what he did is he took the blueprints and he made up uh, these forms. Uh, and um, uh, now what we can do is that we can take these forms and go to a foundry and they can cast cast a, a bracket, uh, bracket or brackets uh, uh, for us is yet um, this, this form here is yet uh, y you see is, is quite small. Well, um, uh, the reason why we have this one is that there has to be a hole running up through the center of the, uh, of the bracket for, for the taillight brackets is yet uh, and this will enable when, when they're Casting the bracket, this will, will enable them to to actually uh, uh, create the hole for the uh, 
well, you know, for the inside. Is that the, you want to maybe talk yeah. about that? Some the, of these things are pretty detailed. I want to just walk out here and get a better look at them. Yeah, yeah, do, yeah, you, yeah, do you yeah, want to come up? Yeah, do you yeah, want to walk around? To come up is yet, uh, yeah, this is certainly a very interactive. Hmm? Uh, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Absolutely. No, no, please yes. So that's a wooden form? Uh, yes. yes, it is. How do you, how do you pour a metal mold in a wooden form? These are used to make the sand forms sand cast. Yes. that go sand into cast. a sand right. cast. That's a preform that forms another cast that. The That's correct. Yes. Yes. Yep. This, it, uh, this one goes together and will get the sand poured in it that then gets suspended within the sand casting the, of the core. Right. So it's a positive and negative. That's correct. Yes. Yes. Is it, uh, and this, uh, this, this mold could be used for any type of, of metal. Is it, uh, and uh, what they were originally on the archive. Uh, drawings that we got is that these were originally uh, made of uh, bronze and that's and that's what we'll use uh, you know uh, to, to recreate these is that uh, so we're very fortunate at the shop to have a pattern maker um, I, I was at iris a couple weeks ago and you know you talked as well about the value of the pattern maker in the boat building and it makes our work at the shop very good in that we can recreate parts that we may not have. And you'll see later in the slides that that workmanship translates well into building the bodies because he sees in three dimensions and compound curves and everything. So it's, it's very valuable. The, you know, in now, now they would do this in, in 3D. Is that, uh, but this is this is old technology. Is that, uh, but sometimes you know we still, you know we still use old old technology to get you know to to the end uh, product. How, how yes. Do you find like the three uh, D printing is it a lot less finished work? You must have to if you sand cast it. You have to probably up it down. Yeah, there's there's a, a little. It depends on the foundry, and it really depends on. On the material that's being used, is that uh, you know as well, is that uh, there are some uh, foundries that uh, it it comes out rather smooth. Is that uh, again it depends it depends depends on the pour as well, who and who's pouring it. Is that uh, you know and maybe you know what if it's done in aluminum you know, you know what is the alloy, um, so it you know it varies. Would you say there's something? Something you said for following the traditional process, your, the way you handle the object uh, and how you refine it as you you sand it and manipulate it, it, it comes out looking can come out looking more like the original than if you use a substitute technology. Would, uh, you, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I would. Is that um, uh, fortunately this particular bracket is a painted bracket, so it's not like you know sending it off to the plate or is that. Uh, and uh, you know, hours later, is that uh, you know, buildup of copper and nickel and, and, and chrome. Um, so, but fortunately, is that you know, this one is is, is painted. Is that uh, so. however, this one is chromed. Uh, this is another unobtainium handle that we have a mold for a, a pattern for that we've had cast that we'll be using on a car. So uh, these are. Can we pass it around? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, absolutely. So somebody looking to have, just because you're that type of person, I want an authentic new piece of something, or I want my car to be exactly as it was made. This is the way to do it. It's it, yeah. It is it is a way to do it. Yes, correct. Yeah. Um. Yes. Do, do some of your clients say, I want it made how the original was made? Technique and everything. I'm curious. Are they picky on Sometimes. Is that there, it's, it's kind of few and far between as long as it has, you know, the correct shape and the look to it. Is that, uh, 
uh, a, a lot of people are satisfied, you know, you know, with that. Um, let me move down here. Um, <clears throat> here's an example of where we did something both in steel and in wood to stamp steel. And this goes back to, it, it's a small indentation that makes a wiper bracket. It's where the windshield wiper mounts on a header panel in a, in a Model A. So, so it's a male-female, is that, uh, and... Um, you press it, yeah. you press it. Yeah. Right. Is that, uh, what, what we found, sometimes it's trial and error, what we found is that this wasn't uh, using maple is it, or using wood, it wasn't, the stamping wasn't as crisp as we wanted it to be. Is that, uh, so what we did is we ended up, um, you know, Rick will show you, is that, uh, we, we ended up using a steel. It, it turned into a steel component. And again, it slides together very, very tight and very accurately and uh, made a better press. You know, it made a better indentation. Sure. And uh, yeah, that all, is. All that for this. <coughs> now, is it cheaper to make a wood one than a metal one? It, it it is is because we have that in-house pattern maker so is that the uh, so so we tried tried the wood we we've, we've done other in in I don't know maybe at this point we should show them you know the rear sill plate there yeah um. this all is a pattern for making this <clears throat> and in this case the wood was better because of the way it left the finish on the wood, on the, on the aluminum. Right, so this, so this was, we, we bought polished aluminum, all right, in, in which this part is supposed to be polished. And uh, we had our pattern maker uh, make, make the male, female dies, and then we pressed this out. Now we could have done this with a bead roller, is that, uh, but with in, in a bead roller, or we could have used another machine called a, a Pomex. The problem is, is that it, it would have left this um, somewhat wavy. And so when we uh, decided to use the, the, wooden, um, the, uh, the wooden fixture, is that uh, it left it really nice and straight. So y you think about you know, cost and the cost you know, to build that was expensive, but then if you, if you make this w with a machine, okay, then you have to get all the lumps and waves out of it, and, and, and they're, they're mild, but, but they're still going to show, is that, uh, so you, you know, you weigh, you know, you know, you try and weigh, weigh the cost and, uh, and what, what is going to be, you know, uh, the outcome. So how, did, how did you form that? You form with these yeah. two. Wood against wood? Can, wood against wood in yeah. a press. Can we put this? So, <coughs> so where would that piece of trim be used? It, it's a rare, um, uh, rare door. It's, it's for a, a, a truck, but it's for the rear, uh, like a delivery truck. So it's a rare sill, you know, for for the rear door is yet uh, so. Now, when you go to make that, will you make a couple of extra just so the We, we do, yeah, yeah. Is that the? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so it's more of a materials question, but I can see where you, you, you have maple molds there and you have to really weigh what type of metal you're gonna want first. Like obviously a, a, a tougher metal, so a more bendable metal will save your mold versus a more brittle metal. Yep. Can you give a comment on like, like who makes a decision where, okay, we're going to do aluminum, it's maple, it's fine, we're going to, uh, where do you kind of draw the line with, with maple? So, um, when, I'm, I'm so not, I don't know if I understand so your question. The, the material that it has to be made of is kind of set in stone based on what the use is in the vehicle. 
So then it would be the knowledge of, of our woodworker of Gray to know which type of wood is going to be able to move the metal the best. So, so this is a good sense of material science because you have to know. Very much so. And, and it works with our, it works as well with our metal shop. Um, knowing the materials, knowing the thicknesses, and knowing how to manipulate the materials. You know, it, it's interesting, and I, I have some pieces over here we're going to show in a few minutes on metal forming. And our metal shop, the guys think of, think of what they do as working with putty. You know, they think of the metals as putty. They can be manipulated and worked and bent and smoothed and you know, they know if they apply heat here, it's going to cause an issue over here. So when they're building door skins or rolling panels or anything else, they know the properties of the materials and where it's going to impact with what they do. It seems like a lot of uh, on-the-job experience. Like it, correct. Yes. It, it is. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> Trying to get younger people involved and with the ability of their shops around that teach to try and pass that knowledge on is kind of a challenge in what we yeah. do is getting the young people that have that drive to learn. So um, I'm going to show a video or just this slide right here while we're in the patterns. This is the trunk of a Mercedes that we restored. So, and so it's, it's, it's <clears throat> if you look at yeah, Ray's pointing, there's one right at the latch post. Yeah. That one, the one under the latch post. Right. Um, if you'll notice, that's this. And we were unable to get the part. And the question becomes, well, why didn't you do it as just individual pieces? But if you did an individual piece and made this stamping, you'd end up with warping in the wood down here in the steel that you'd then have to contend with when you did this one. So it was far more efficient to make one piece. So we took this, put the sheet metal in between it, stamped it, and then they worked the, worked the correct dimensions around the edges and welded it in the car. Yes, sir. Is that what comes is, is that walnut? No, no, this is maple. maple. Yeah, yeah. Is that the best wood that you can work with? It has been for us. Is that, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stable wood, is that, uh, and um, uh, it will take quite a beating. Is that, uh, How does that compare with uh, teak or mahogany or citrus spruce? Or? Much more dense, right? Yeah, much more dense, what yeah. About green wood, which is what about what? Green wood. Uh, yeah, yeah, we've never used, used, um, uh, you know, green wood is yet, uh, very, very dense and very hard. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if that would be more difficult to work. Oh, it's impossible to work to break your saw. Okay. I mean, that's, yeah. I, that, that's a, yeah. I think it means green wood is a common name for some really hard. Yeah. yeah, right. Not, yeah. <coughs> not, not green. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 I understand yeah, that. Sure. Yeah. Well, it has an exotic name. We yeah, so it's a, it's a really super dense, it yeah. sinks, it doesn't float, it sinks. Yeah. It's almost wow. like, iron, it uh, almost like it iron wood. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the same idea as that, yeah. yeah. Do you do any uh, work with 3D printing? Wouldn't that cut corners and make it quicker? Uh, we, yes, we just, yeah. we just started, beginning. started getting We're into beginning. that. We're beginning. And uh, again, it has, it has, it does have a place in, in, in our business as yet, but with just, what, what would you say, last six or eight months yeah. or so? Yeah, we've we, had a few small parts yeah, made as, as models um, where we've ended up having the, the 3D models turned into a machine turned part. Um, it has its place, as you'll see when we go through the slides, it, the woodcraft in the body, that's, that's just not possible for but if you 3D print a part, in many cases, you still end up having to have machine processes or use it as the mold pattern. Typically, we 3D print the mold, not the part. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's 
kind of a misconception a lot of people have that they think, you know, they see resin 3D printing all over the place that's low cost. And, you know, you can 3D print in textiles, metal, wood, all kinds <coughs> of glass even now. Um, you know, Autodesk software can output G-code to do all this stuff, but uh, really the, it's just much easier to just 3D print your molds and then kind of make that yeah. to the traditional way of using it, it will make the product. You can 3D print the voids. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, you know, we're talking about patterns here and templates and abilities to make components of the cars. Now here we have a buck. You know, this is part of the display and this is for the horch that's on the wall. Uh, it's a car that's being restored. But they use this as a 3D representation of the body of the car to be able to form the metal and it has to fit exactly into there and you can see from the metal work that's been done that it comes off it gets worked it gets rolled it gets machined it gets cut hammered dollied and till it fits the buck so you don't use that as the bones you just use that as a correct that is yeah. that is essentially the pattern to make that component of the car that is traditional old school coach building for, for autos. They, they typically did have bucks that are set up like that. Even back in the, in the time? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, bucks yeah. have been right. used yeah. for generations. Question. Yeah. So, what kind of man hours would you estimate that as we look at it? The, the aluminum? Not the buck, the aluminum. Um, <coughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you're talking weeks. Yeah, weeks. Two and a half weeks. Yeah, weeks. Two, three weeks, weeks of work. Yeah. In the, in the hours. yeah. On the bill and the restoration, it's between. By the time it gets in the car, it's it's over forty thousand dollars. Wow. Just that one piece. Yeah. Piece. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's very labor intensive. They're talking about things here that are very labor intensive. Yeah. And of course, this piece literally, if you look at the, uh, the photograph, lower photograph, it literally fits on that ash frame. And that's one of the remarkable things they'll talk about as well. Let's have some examples. But the amount of wood that's hidden behind these panels on the cars and stay with the cars is really remarkable. We have, let me come back over to. To this. Does it work okay with me coming oh, out yeah, and, yeah. and showing? Um, these four blocks are pattern blocks that were made up that have the different contours as a bumper curved around the car. And we had to recreate the bumper because it does not exist and we had to pattern it exactly as it was. So we use these for the buildup of the bumper. that we, we built the center section, which essentially was the pattern that had the groove in it. We had to put curves in this, and then we had to build the top and the bottom flats of the bumper. And that, this is for a Lamborghini Jirama. Yeah. Uh, these are the patterns and profiles that we used to lay the bumper in as it came around so that we could make it. Now to make this, we have a machine that we made dies for that we can pull a long piece of sheet metal through that create the, the profile in the part. So now we're using metal to make metal along with wood. We set up a template of what the rear end of the car looks like so we could build the contours of the bumper. That's quite a large, a large part, so we did not bring it. But this is another example of using wood to make parts for the modern cars. They, again, as this is, you know, as part of the restoration process. But I think, I think we should yeah, kind of yeah. talk through some yep. of the, um, the slides we have. I brought, you, you'll see over on the, the end of the table there, there's four pieces of aluminum that we'll go through as we get through the shop. Yes, sir. The question I had earlier was, the piece that you made there that had uh, the 
four stamps. Yep. What kind of millet is the, you know, what gauge steel or, or what type of metal? Is it, is it steel? Yeah, it is it, steel. It's steel. It's, it's 19 gauge. At 19 gauge? Yeah. So relatively thin. Yes. And so, and so therefore, you really don't have to heat it then to do that particular piece. No. No. If, if you heated it, you would destroy your right. your your forms. Yes. And that's why I was curious as to yep. the millage of it. It's cool for us. Now, we had a company who invented a car, who designed a car with all the IP or the blueprints. So you guys can make the parts for the car now? Sure. Yeah. With no issues and well, yeah. I'm not saying no issues, but uh, <laughs> yes, is that uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's got to be thought out, is that? Uh, but uh, it's it, oh, you're it asking if we have a blueprint, if we can legally basically using somebody else's technology or idea, recreate their own. If it if it's oh. a publicly domained blueprint, basically what you're getting is a set of measurements. Um, that could theoretically be made off of an original part. Um, so we've never had yeah, we've never had any, any infringement yeah. issues with with that. This is actually what one of the actually that's the tail light bracket right there. That is this. <laughs> um, this is early in the slide. This is going to show what the completed vehicle looks like of one of the vehicles that we're building in the shop. It's a Model A town car delivery, which was a, a car that was on paper a good idea, but in, in practice never worked so well. <laughs> <clears throat> this, is a, um, this is a Napier that came to the shop with, with a template car that came with it. This is the one that Donald mentioned that's in the museum over in the hay. And the customer wanted a touring car body on it. And we had a template car to, to build off of. So this is as we got the chassis down to a strip chassis. So that's a rolling chassis as you would have bought it from the manufacturer? It, well, it's as we needed to remove components of it to get to where we could build the body to put the coach work on it. See, see, a lot of those cars back then is that the independent coach builders built, you, you would order what you wanted. And so you would buy the chassis. Rolls Royce was famous for that sort of thing. Is that, uh, and you would uh, design, you know, have the, uh, um, the coach builder designed the body that you want on there, and they would, they they would produce the body for you. Is that uh, so? A lot of times it was it was a chassis, engine, and firewall, and then from from the firewall back was uh, was a uh, was a coach built uh, body. I put this in as kind of a, a final. This is what the end result was of us building the body for it. Now I'm going to show steps as we went through and how it came up from essentially like building a house or building a building from the sills up. This is the very beginnings of the bottom platform and the backrests of the the body that we're building. And I, I could have brought a hundred slides, but <laughs> it, it jumps ahead several steps. But this is the platform it's being built on with the front seat and the rear seat as the, the woodwork is being laid out. And this is all based on measurements and visualizing the inside structure of the body that we had as an example. We weren't able to disassemble it, but we were able to take measurements off it. And then this is as the, as the shell was being formed on it. And we'll, as we get down to the, the last bit of the, the props we brought, you'll see how some of the metal shaping process works. 
but it's essentially being built around the wooden frame of the, the structure of the vehicle. So, so this particular car, we didn't have a buck, okay? We just went by an original car. Um, and that's where a pattern maker is, is, is very much needed. And that, that wood stayed in the car? That, that is the structure. The, that's, yeah, that's part of the body, yes. And why was the, uh, what was the reason that you had to rebuild the, the coach? He wanted a different body. Yeah. It, it was, that was the original body. It was just the single seat with the tank behind it. And he wanted the touring car body. <laughs> it's, 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 it's in the tradition of uh, cars of this period. In this period, uh, the rolling chassis didn't really change year to year. Yeah. And we, there are great examples like in the Durham Coach Works in Philadelphia where Mrs. Strawbridge, Strawbridge and Co. Clothier uh, Farm Stores, goes back to the Durham Coach Works four years later to have, a, to have a new body put on her chassis. If she wanted a new car, she just put a new body on it. And they took it even a step further. She had a summer body and a winter body for the same <laughs> car. And they would change the body seasonally. <laughs> so it's really in that tradition that we're talking about. It's, and it's not necessarily um, considered a bad thing in this period. Yes, sir. What, what's the technique you used to fasten the metal to the wood? Like, I'm sure there was an original technique. Like, was it a, was it a rivet? It's a fastener system? Was it a glue system? Like, how, what, what did they do the then? The, um, they originally, um, at least the uh, bodies that I've taken apart, is that they were usually used like a, a small little ring nail. And uh, we, we use a ring nail, is that, uh, but we don't use steel ones. We use stainless steel ones. Is that, uh, but you, if, Rick, if you could just, yeah, so, nope, back to the, so, where are you? All right, so these these are applied moldings right here. So they the uh, these moldings actually cover up all all of the nails as yet. Uh, so they're they're hidden behind the um, the uh, applied moldings, and so you don't ever see them. And then again, you don't ever have to worry about any any rust or anything like that. Is yet uh, you know they'll they'll outlast you know the They'll literally, you know, you know, last forever. All the moldings had to be made, you know, with the correct contours and the correct shape and curves. So do you go by the traditional fasteners versus, you know, let's say using rivets? We try to adhere to how it was built the best we can. Uh, with fasteners today. I mean, you'll see these are all slot head wood screws. Um, so yeah, traditional methods that you'll see in the, the Model A as well. You know, all the traditional methods of pinning and screwing were used. But all, you know, we had to fabricate all, all of this, all, all of the railings that uh, and uh, behind the front seat, there was a, a there brass railing. There was a railing. very ornate rail. Yeah, uh, so we had to make, make all of that. These were styled after the original body that we had to use. Hey guys, a lot of the cars I inspect in this period, especially British cars, they use ash for the wood frames. And, and this is ash. Okay. techniques today that aren't from the 20s or the teens or coatings or whatever that can preserve the ash better than they did back in the day? Uh, on this particular uh, body, we use a, uh, a boat uh, epoxy, uh, which is, um, oh, help me out, three, systems three, yeah. is that, uh, and we coat it, you know, we coat all the wood, is that, uh, so behind all these aluminum panels and uh, well, well, everything is coated with, with Systems 3. Is that, we, uh, we know with the Morgan here in the gallery, in the video, they, they dip their frames uh, in borates, which uh, prevent 
fungal attack and also insect damage. It helps anyway. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Yep. This is as we were also beginning to hang all the top resting spots, all the, all the various brackets and pieces. I'm going to get to that later. This is the, the brass rail Ray was talking about on the back of the um, front seat for the rear passengers to hold. But this is as the body is coming together. You can see this is starting to be, you can see it's coated at this point in the assembly. The door, the lines, we had to cast in a similar method to this, we had cast the hinges for the doors. Yeah, door handles, you know, you know made all the door latches. It was a very interesting project, um, but you can see this wood's all been treated. See, can you just go back? So, so these panels here, they, they were made on an English wheel. Is that, uh, you can kind of see the difference between this and, and this right here. Is that uh, English wheel will give you those compound curves is that, uh, that, that were needed. I, actually, you can see it right here too. This, this was done on an, on an English wheel. Pretty, pretty much, yeah, yeah. Is that uh, it, someone who knows what they're doing can make it look really easy? But you should try it sometime. <laughs> is that uh, yeah? You have that panel going every which direction. Is that uh, between an English wheel and a planishing? But a planishing uh, hammer is is usually a um, is is uh, is pneumatic or air air driven. Okay, is that uh, so? If you had a lumpy panel, okay, is that uh, say say you had a panel like this, all right, is that you could take and and run this through a plenishing hammer and it would take out all of these marks, is that uh, and, and and make it smooth, smooth like that, is that uh, and whereas an English wheel, yes, you could still do it with an English wheel, is that uh, you know you, you know as well, it's just. Uh, it sort of depends on the craftsman, you know, what, what, what they kind of favor. Yes. yes. This car that you were, that you're working on, that tow trailer, was, would you say 1920? No, uh, this is on, on, on 1906. Yes, that's correct. And then they apply the yeah, right. That's it, correct. You you can see that in the exhibit here. Right. You know, it starts down there with the carriage, and and they, that was also a way of people keeping the craftsmen. Yeah. And, and uh, their methods. I I was commenting to David to David earlier. You know that the coach down there was fully a wood wood built coach. And in this era, they started skinning that with some metal. The Brewster Coach Works in Connecticut <coughs> is in business in the late 19th century. They don't go out of business until 1956. So they follow the trends in transportation and applying a lot of the same craftsman techniques as they move through time. And then as we got to the 40s, they started bringing the wood back except on the outside. <laughs> this is an example of a couple of components that we just had to make. And they're just made of, of bar stock and round stock and welded up. This is an original off the other car and this is the one we made to duplicate. Uh, an example of the door and then the door with the skin on it. Uh, just showing the progress as this, this particular project went. We also had to build the top. Um, and these are all the components that went into to building the top. Uh, it's steam bent wood uh, for all the bows and we had to make all the irons 
and the hinges and the brackets and everything. But again, it's, it's very nice when you have an example. You know, we have the skill in the shop to make anything, especially if we have an example. You know, then, then you have that ability to, to see your, your work instead of guessing. That's it as it's assembled. I'll get back to those. <clears throat> this is a Model A. Uh, it's actually the one that was in the earlier picture, the town car delivery, that the taillight bracket came from. And this is essentially the, the sills. This is the beginning of the structure. So we have the frame that runs underneath it all the way up to here. But these pieces here are the sills that the rest of the structure is built on. Those are oak. Uh, those are old oak. Uh, well, not old oak, but they're oak. And then the structure gets built up on it from there. This is the structure as it's beginning to take form. Oops. <coughs> now the way the Model A's were built, specifically the, the town car deliveries, deluxe deliveries, they were very wood intensive and were essentially the whole structure was built out of wood and then just basically skinned in steel. <coughs> so there's a surprising amount of wood in this car. On these types of builds, when Ford or other makers were doing it, were they giving them some more braking power? I mean, this is a lot of weight to add on there, right? I mean, even the town cars, right? I'm recently reading with um, W.O. Bentley's autobiography again, and he's bitching about, like, these people who are ordering up town car bodies to put on a three-liter yeah. race car, basically, and now the car can't stop. It can't get up the hill. It's burning the clutch, right? What's the weight difference in some of these bodies, like the one that you were showing on the Napier, and it comes in stripped down. It's just a seat in a tank, and it goes out with this gigantic body on it. Does the car stop, and can it can it be used in tours, or is it just a static car? That's where they have anchors. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Is that the uh, well? Well, the Napier. Okay. Is so that the? Uh, just have brakes on one axle. Yeah, the Napier had, uh, I, I don't remember what, what the uh, displacement was of the engine, but it was, it was pretty substantial for its time. Matter of fact, uh, the Napier was ro one of Rolls-Royce's competition is at, at the time. Is that, uh, uh, but the second half of your question is that the uh, uh, Model A Ford, no, you could, it was the same chassis as a Roadster, which was tremendously lighter, is that it, it really didn't make any difference. If it was like a, like a ton and a half truck, it still had the same engine, is that, uh, as what a passenger car would have. From is a that, uh, point of view, I think it's really nice though to have it restored and built exactly the way it was and have the visceral experience of driving it, trying to stop it. <laughs> the reality is a lot of our early cars have, have uh, disc brakes put on them for safety reasons yeah. and they're allowed in most rallies now for good reason. Um, but uh, it's always a joke, right? None of these things stop, right? You, you, you know, surprisingly, Model A's with mechanical brakes with all of the pins in good shape and all of the bushings linkages and, yeah. and bushings and everything else in good shape stop surprisingly well. They, a, a car with properly adjusted mechanical drum brakes does pretty good, especially when you have 40 horsepower. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, that's, that's a lot. That, that it, I, I mean, it, it makes it so you don't get going terribly fast to begin with. <laughs> but you drive a little different when you're driving an old car. Your distances are a little different. You, you just kind of get used to it. It's tough in modern traffic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Um, this body was probably heav as heavy as any body. I would think Except so. for the delivery. No, um, yeah. Or is this even heavier? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm, I'm, there, I'm not sure. There but. is a good bit of wood to your point. Yeah. And no, they did not make chassis any different. 
Um, the Napier, though, to your point, I'm sure they built one chassis. And the, the touring car that was behind it in the picture, I'm sure had the chassis, same chassis under it. This is what the, that shell looks like as the sheet metal starts to get on it. Um, but this is probably a carryover to the, the zeros and the teens and the twenties to where they were using the old coach building skills to um, continue building cars and just draping them in the sheet metal. Uh, we brought actually, it's at the end of the table, right? this um, right. to show just a little bit about how they fought through the construction. You know, Henry was not one and the wood and the builders were not ones to waste wood. And you can see it in the woody, in the fender well of the woody. But they use extensive use of finger joints and glue and nails. And they, they made it very strong, but still very practical to make out of wood. You didn't have to glue up or you didn't have to waste vast amounts of wood to make the components. We were talking about this earlier. It, yeah. It's, it's a pretty, in, in contrast to all the steam bending you see in boat building, um, this idea of using solid segments that are finger joined right. um, is much more common in all of this car, all this coach work. And, when and is the, uh, the crossover? I'm familiar with, for instance, the J. Bo Shamrock 5, 1930, and it had steel frame and wood hull. And by the time they get to 36 and they're building Ranger and uh, at Bath Iron Works, they've got uh, steel frames and they get bronze plate and you burn your hands and put it on the hull. So is that the changeover for cars too? Uh, um, early 30s? No. I, I wouldn't say that, would you? No, no, I wouldn't. I, I'd say, you know, mid to like later 30s uh, for, for like an ordinary car. Is that, the, and again, some of the coach built cars is that, the, you know, they, they actually went into the, in, into the 40s. Is that, the, um, I have something to do with scale and quantity, too, and the fact that you know it still was practical and economical to, to do things in wood and yeah. not in metal. And there were, the wood is staying, David, if the wood staying in the car, it must have had four iterations. And the General Motors must have had hundreds of car They did. Yeah, so yeah. Like a, yeah. Uh, yeah. The rich metal wood. Yeah, Henry, Ford, uh, Ford, I think, 36 might have been the last, the last of it. Was that where the wood was used I, last? I believe so. Well, with the exception of like top bows and, yep. and things of that nature. But uh, um, Chevrolet GM, you know, did use a, a lot of wood as well. I'm not quite sure when, or Dodge or Plymouth. Yeah, we were. I'm not quite sure. Certainly all the way through the mid 30s, we, we see a lot of wood in the doors, um, in the body so shell. We all, we all think of the 1939 Woody, like the Ford over here. Um, now that was that was for the station wagon only. Yeah, um, right. You know, Ford was into vertical integration. You know, he bought up tens of thousands of acres of forest in, in Michigan and, and central South uh, Canada, and was in control of the whole process of felling, milling, grading wood specifically to build wood wagons. And if there's a picture over in the far gallery, you, you realize home clay macro, they're making, there's an assembly line, they're making dozens of these at a time and there's dozens of woodworkers fitting all the parts right. as it comes through. Yeah, we, I, I remember 36, 37, the Chevy, the doors were all wood. All wood, yeah. Inside the framing yeah. was all yeah, wood. Uh, so they they continued on with it quite a while. Or Duesenberg has wood frame doors. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and the thing about MGTD. I mean, yeah, that was uh, through the 50s. Yeah, TF, okay. You know, that was still, 
still a lot of wood. Still in largely that car. wood. Kind of, kind of depend on on the on the manufacturer. Is that? Uh, to your point, Donald, I think the the types of stresses in a race boat uh, dictated different materials, and when they were trying to do something new and innovative, it was also um, the introduction of steel came earlier. Um, because of the stresses, need, you know, that a boat like that would be under, I think it's just a different solving a different problem. So, if we talk about how I'm talking about cars and boats together, crisscraft must be kind of right in the middle. Of they are, but again, the scale of them is so small, and Warren can address this as well. Um, you know, this the, the crisscraft you're sitting next to is. Uh, it's pretty simply simple in construction, wouldn't you say, Warren? I mean, yeah. um, not a lot of stress. Um, it's a lot yeah, more like that finger joint. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. Sawn frames. It also has a hard chine, so you know, and not a lot of curves. So hard chines. Um, you were talking about you know, um, sawn frames. Sawn sawn frames. Uh, Carbo planking, but what, were they, you, you, what kind of planking was that you said the other night? Tight seam. <laughs> Tight seam, you know, where, um, you know, so it's, again, they're, they're building to the amount of stress and complication that, that's needed, and it's not, not so much. And a car, I think, is, is sort of in between this and maybe a high-performance sailboat. You know. If I'm correct, I think Chris Crap uh, engages some kind of a partnership with Ford. I think they did, in uh, sourcing materials and... Uh, Methods that are certainly physically close to one another. They knew each other well. Um, also, the engines, don't forget, are, you know, in this case, it's a GM block with lots of uh, proprietary Chriscraft parts on it. But, you know, there's definitely a lot of reason to be, to be collaborating. This is <clears throat> another one, but it is a representation of the body of the Ford as it's getting more attached, more tied down, all the nails are in, and it's looking more like a proper vehicle. That's a little further along in the process. So now I have these four pieces of aluminum over here and I skipped over the slides that represent what works on it. They got interspersed. So here is our tie-in to wood helping form metal. <laughs> this is a piece of a log. It's a piece of a tree that we have several of them around the shop that are dished out into different shapes, different thicknesses, different angles. And we use those to begin the process of beating a panel. And that's a very heavy leather wrap sandbag. And our woodworkers, uh, our metal shapers, favorite hammer. I'm then going to jump, I'm going to jump to the slides and then I'll show you all the panels. Where was it? This is a panel, this is a, it's a press, but we have these two jigs that we made. There's, there's two V's essentially that point like this and then this that, that goes down and literally puts a deep dent into a piece of metal. And after the shape is made in the sand, the, the shrinking, that's, this is a process called shrinking, actually happens. And then they work it more in the, in the wood. And then they work it on the English wheel. This is an English wheel. It was developed primarily by early English coach builders, body builders, to form compound curves. And this is flat. That's a machined, very flat surface. And this whole box is full of different shaped anvils that will, when the anvil puts pressure on the flat piece of steel, it makes it want to bend. So the, the differing arcs of the anvils will give you different bends in the steel. So now I'm going to walk over to the, the pieces, Ray. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, also is that uh, um, 
down here there's there's actually a knob okay in in depending on how how much shape and form you want to put into the piano it, in depending on how much pressure you want to put this this will move up and down is yet uh and um you know that's that's also very very critical is yet uh because that will will determine you know again Oh no, no, it's all by hand. Yeah. All by hand. Yeah, yeah. This is a real, real English wheel. Is that uh, so? Yeah. He is. He is doing. Yes. The motion. So here is a flat piece. This happens to be aluminum because it's easy to work, easy to make up fairly quickly for a demo. This is after it's been in the shrinker. It, it's had that process. So. It's been started in the sandbag, and then it was put in the press to put these big V's in it. If you want to pass it around, you can take a look at the beginnings of it. But you're mixing aluminum and steel? Um, we can use either metal. The process is the same. This, these are all aluminum, um, the four pieces I have. just because of the ease of doing a quick demo with it. You're asking if aluminum and steel are mixed in the Oh, I think I'm allowed to sit on the chair. Oh, it's a boat bo thing, yeah. Put it there, get from Oh, the, um, the reaction. Yeah. Yeah, no, we don't, we don't typically put them together, although some cars are built with them together. Austin Healy was famous for that. Um, they had an aluminum shroud and they had steel wings and they put a little piece of cloth between them and the beading on the fenders, but that's generally a good rod area. So what, what Jeff did with this is he started here. Here is the first shrink that came out of the press. And then he starts hammering up the sides of it. And the process doesn't just hammer it back flat because then you end up with no gain. What he's actually doing is he's hammering it in a way that actually folds it together. And I, I said our metal workers think of metal as a putty. But I guess technically if you were to take a, a measuring tool and measure right here versus in the center of a shrunk section, it would probably be just a whisker thicker. But this is, he did this on purpose to show from the beginning as he started hammering and shrinking it. But, but you can see how as he's working his way around, it's beginning to dish more, but be smooth. Do you have a picture of the hammer? Or is it the hammer on the log? It's the hammer on the log. Right, the log. Yes. It, It's that wood mallet. Now and it's the hammer on the yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. he'll uh, do that with the wood mallet. Really? Yep. And then this is after the English wheel. Now, what brought it to that? The English wheel. English wheel. Huh? Was it bigger than that? They they all started. As this. Uh, well, he rounded them. So how many hours is it to get it to the point where you can use it in the car? Depends on the panel. Just, just I mean, this, this demo took him an hour and a half. Yeah, something like that, yeah. yeah. An hour and a half to do the four pieces. Not counting cutting, cutting the aluminum, but he's, he's proficient at it. I mean, it'd take me two days, but um, he's very proficient at it. But the, the concept of taking that big V and pounding it into a flat curve, it, it takes kind of a... a that's, that's what I was wondering. As you pound that big V down to make the curve, doesn't it stretch the metal bag out? Depends how you pound it. <laughs> and, and that's what he does. He, he works it into the V. So, 
as he's working it, he's working it from the base and somewhere's the one that has the pattern as it goes around. Is that, right right you're literally shrinking it and, and you're, you're bringing the material together. And that's no what allows it to maintain the arc. No heat. No heat. No. And the original process to create that is with what? <coughs> with the hammer in the middle. Yeah. And that. Yes, it yes. is. Yep. Get a young person. <clears throat> I have two more. Oh, I have yeah. two more young people, both in, in one works with them in welding yeah. and uh, the others in welding and mechanical, but they well, love the old stuff. Yeah, we're extremely lucky because most young people are, are not going into this trade. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, one of them, uh, the, the gentleman who works with Jeff, came from our local community college welding program. We approached them, and, and you know, you kind of ask, is, you know, the welding program, this is the person I'm looking for. You know, the one who's creative, the one who just kind of gets it and played with models as a kid. and. You know, you begin to, to learn how to ask the questions to try to see the mechanical aptitude. You just want to keep them out of electric boat. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the new hire, the younger guy, um, as we were interviewing, one of the, the comments he made that made us very interested in him was that he went to Arizona, New Mexico, to a blacksmithing program because he wanted to learn it. You know, he wanted to learn to work metal. And, and that's what we need, you know. It, a good welder can put a bead, but you need that craftsman that wants to learn how to work metal. And Jeff and, and Tom both, you know, have that in them to want to work metal. And we, we're fortunate. We've got a, we've got a great shop. Yeah. Um, and going around the shop, we've got a great guy and, you know, came from some collision work, accident reconstruction. He understands how it bent, how to unbend it, how to take things apart, how the factory did it. Um, we've got body paint. We've got mechanical. It's, we're, we're fortunate. It's, it's a great place to be. We used to be rich in that stuff, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice if we can get the kids to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you want to go to college, go for two years, learn something, learn how to shake somebody's hand, but go to work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, finding, <clears throat> and one of, the, one of the guys in our mechanical area came out of a dealership that just couldn't stand flat rate. All he wanted to do was fix things and the flat rate was making him crazy and he fit right, oh, in, right in with what we do yeah. you know he's he's meticulous he's detailed so it, it it's it all works well the wheel you can see is made by a company called Renala um, they're from the 30s and 40s in England they they made aircraft during the war that wheel probably did they were made that back then that's that old but it's uh it's quite a place it's we really enjoy having the opportunity to get to do this with yes. these vehicles yeah, and i want to thank you all for coming it's uh, been a great audience how many people are in your operation uh we have a total of 16 people it, that's including office staff as well now, do you have a picture of the finish the, the one you were rebuilding, the green one there? No. I, I don't. <laughs> I, I had one that I had sent. Um, it's over in the museum in The Hague, and I had a capture that I had taken off the website, but 
No. Now, was the car worth more after you did it than it was before, or <coughs> because it was the same error, about the, about the same? Um, I don't know. Would you, I, I it, back to the conversation before where we were talking about different bodies going on different chassis and how you, they changed them yeah. on a whim. Mm -hmm. I don't think it changed it. Changed if anything, it might have increased. <clears throat> it, it became a more practical, more usable, more ornate vehicle than it was. So I, I don't think it diminished it. Are there any questions? that you guys have? Anything you want to talk about that we haven't talked about? Do you guys ever in do events at your place? Tours? We, we do, yes. Yep. Cool. And what's the hardest car you ever worked on? Hardest in what way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Yes>. Um, <laughs> you know, where it was more difficult to do stuff on it or whatever. You've touched yeah, more of them than I, you but. The one that sticks out that was a real yeah, I can't. The, they're hard in different ways. It, you know, the Napier body was hard because it was creating from scratch. We've got some mid 70s European sports cars, ESOs, a Lamborghini, the, the Jarama. Um, those were very interestingly put together. You know, a, a Maserati we have. Yeah. They're electrically, mechanically, yeah, just high, challenging. Yeah, hydraulics. Um, we have a Maserati that was built during their ownership by Citroen, and it's got that hydraulic system in it. You know, so the same hydraulics that's running the power steering and the brake system drives the power seat and the headlight doors. Um, yeah. You know, and it's all that unique fluid. Um, some of the 50s, 60s Rolls Royces with the braking systems. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, they all bring their they all bring their challenges, you know, and and sometimes it's a challenge in different areas of the shop. Mm -hmm. You know, the the Italian mid 70s, early 70s Italian boutique cars that have four layers of bare steel welded together in a place that catches water, make it a challenge for the metal shop. <laughs> we replaced one, you know, the last bottom 12 inches of the car. Um, body has challenges in contours and shapes. Wood certainly has challenges. So. It, there's there's not one that stands out as, you know, oh my gosh, we wouldn't take that one back. No, you get, you, so you don't see one and say, oh no, not another one of these couple of years. No, no, I can't, I can't think, no. think of anything. No, I, I mean, we enjoy the, the challenges of being able to recreate. We yes? We don't have the largest budget. I, I didn't, I which, didn't. One, which cars have the largest budget? Um... Yeah, I you know we've we've done some muscle cars and uh, they've they've invested tremendously more into the car than what the car is worth is yet uh, but you know the ones I'm thinking of is yet you know they've had the car since they were in high school or something like that is yet uh, so the, so there's sentimental value there is yet uh, um, yeah I don't I. I I think the cars take what they're going to take to do and we work with the customers through the process um, all the way along. You know, it's when a car rolls in, in whatever shape it's in, it's very difficult to say it's going to be this to restore it because we, we look at restoration as restoration. You know, and any of the cars in here, um, that this is an example, you know, this is restoration, this is recreating, it's touching every component. Uh, it's not, that's clean enough, just dust it and put paint on it. So it varies, but it, generally we work very well with the customers and work to complete the cars. 
kind of a weird answer, but. <laughs> Did you do any work for the Blake brothers? Uh, yes, uh, Kurt, uh, Kurt Blake. Yes. Yet, uh, we did, um, he, he was actually, he was putting together a collection of 36 Fords. Uh, this is, this is going back to the seventies. Yes. Yet, uh, and, uh, we did a, a, a few of those cars for him. Yeah. This great, right. great person. Yes. Yeah. Right, That's very, it. very nice person to yeah. do business with. Yeah. He, he actually he didn't tear down the garage, but he expanded it. Uh huh. He lived on Long Meadow Street for a while and uh, built the whole second floor. It was a garage with multiple cars with a second floor with multiple cars. Uh -huh. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, guess sir. The, I guess the ice cream oh. business is pretty good to yeah, all, it was huh? really good. Yeah. It's yeah. your business is uh, one off. Somebody comes to you and says, I've got a Lamborghini or a Maserati. I want it in perfect nick. Uh, I've run across over the last 20 years or so people that do Defender. Uh, and that's all they do. Yep. They buy them in Africa or Turkey. You know, they get the little play off them and they build a brand new car. You've never thought of doing, taking a specific car like a Porsche 356. And specializing? And just focused on one car. No. No. That, that wouldn't be interesting. Not to no. I, my, my feeling is, you know, as, as the owner, is that you miss out on too many really other good cars if you focus in, you know, you know just one, you know, you know, one car. There seems to be an endless supply of the defenders. So. <laughs> uh, we've worked on yeah, a few. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that, uh, yeah. That's a good example of steel. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not thing. kidding. Yeah, yeah. Well, I yeah. have a newer car than that that's got a major. I have a G wagon, and uh, the way that joint runs down the side of the car, it fills up with water and it rusts. Wow. Hmm. You, you can't get rid of the rust. It doesn't go away. Well, you just have to prevent it from starting. You got to pressure wash don't you don't you can easily have a G without rust but you've got to understand that it rusts from the inside out and you right. have to get all those areas cleaned out I mean I've had over 40 G wagons and you do have to hit them I don't use wax oil or anything and we use them in the winter but you've got to know where to put your pressure washer on like above the spring and shock brackets in the back inside the rocker, all those areas, like on the early 460, there are no drains in the back corners, there are no drains, but you can get all that stuff out of there. It, Folks the just don't know. Right now. What's that? The rust, brand new ones, the rust within the year. Yeah, the newer ones rust easier than the older ones. <laughs> I mean, from, anyway, not to go on forever, but from 1990 to 2000, those are the best ones that don't rust. Before that, they rust, and after 2002, they rust terribly. Planned obstacle lessons. 2004 or five. Yep, yep. No problem. Yes. My question is, um, you were talking about all these molds that you've made, and uh, you know they're they're now one of a kind. Where if somebody has a car like it, they're probably in need of it. So when this the new uh, world technology, are you considered making these again and selling? Them? Uh, I'm I'm really not in the parts business. I'm, I'm really really in, in the restoration business. Is that the, and uh, I I know of a couple of other restoration shops where where they're very creative and, and they and they do this sort of thing, and their success rate is is really not that great. Is that the, I'd rather focus in on. On, on restoration and try to do that as well as I can. Is that uh, and not and, and not you know be scattered all over. You know, typically the parts we're making are because you can't get them because they're for such unique and rare automobiles. So the market for them is not that strong. Take the tail light bracket for example. You know, there's six, <laughs> um, and they probably have one. How do you so. guys know what jobs to turn away? Like, obviously, you have to be profitable, right? Any car could be redone. Uh, 
If yeah. someone comes with a hundred thousand dollar car and it needs three hundred thousand dollars worth of work, obviously that's a, a no, right? But no, you guys no, balance it no, out? not necessarily. Okay. Is that uh, we we vet we vet people? Is that uh, you know are we going to be able to work with these people? Is that uh, do they understand you know the process? Is that uh, and uh, uh, along the way is that. Uh, uh, we very, you know, if they're local people, is that we very much, you know, encourage them to come in on like at least once a month, and then we'll go over the project with them, and then we'll 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 say, look at is that this, you know, next month this is what we have planned for your car, is that uh, so, you know, we, it's communication basically, is that, uh, you know, in, in that's not always if they're not local, you know, what you know we have a. a Packard from from California is that uh, well he flies in you know every once in a while and so you know that that relationship is different than than somebody that that's close by but again we we try to st we try very hard to stay in touch with people uh, send pictures is that uh, and again it's it boils down to communication yeah it's but, a relationship. but in the answer to your question is that you know we try to vet people is that uh, and uh, you know why? You know why are they doing like a '79 Camaro? Is it, I'm just pulling that out. You know, um, in in you know they may have they may have good reasons why they want to do it. It doesn't make any sense, you know, financially. But yeah. you know, to them, yeah, this is this is a car that that they want. Is that uh, so? Um, Again, it, you know, can it's it's about building a relationship with these people. Is that uh, and um, um, I, I guess yeah, I, no, that I, makes sense. I mean, some <coughs> somebody might have boatloads of dough and they just want this car. It doesn't matter if they're going to spend four hundred on a car that's worth hundred. They're not looking at. It. They're, they're not looking at. Right. right. And that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Do folks ever kind of pound you though on getting an estimate rate on a car you haven't done? And is that a challenge? Yeah, no, that uh, w what I will, you know, will try to do is, is give them a, a guess. Okay. All right, or, or if, I, if I've done some other cars, what I'll do is that I'll, I'll look back through my records and I'll, you know, I'll say, okay, this car seems to be in about the same condition that this one was that I did, say, five years ago, and then what I'll do is yet our, our labor rate, has, you know, has gone up. Is yet uh, so? What I'll do is I well, all right, based on, you know, cars similar to what yours, the condition in in you say it's an American car. Is yet, you know, this is what, this is what the the cost of it was. Is yet so you can kind of expect, you know, you know that kind of a, you know, you know, you know, end cost. Is yet, uh, but then. You know, along the way is that we have a saying in the shop, you know, every car seems to have project creep. All right, so you start out with very good intentions, but what happens is that, uh, you know, once you get into it, you know, you find other, other things that, uh, you know, that, that, that have to be addressed. And again, that's communication is that, uh, you know, pardon me? Yeah, you know, could be. Is that uh, you know, could be you know, you know, or is that uh, you know, we didn't we didn't see, you know, that the that the inner part of the cowl was is rotted out because it still had upholstery on it. Is that you know, we you know, we do look at you know, we look you know uh, at the car as closely as we can, but we can't tear the car apart. Is that uh, you know, uh, you know, to give them to give you know people a really firm price and sometimes the customers wants change huh? while you're there can you do this and yeah. yes i'm just saying so you document carefully yes yes it, it's a partnership with the customers it really is all right we still have some more time if you have more questions we could walk around and, yeah uh, i had the opportunity to do it earlier with with uh, Ryan Rick, it'd be really great if you made some comments on some of the cars in the collection here. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.